with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and all thy strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We thank you for that commandment. We declare and decree that we've employed those two commandments in our lives here at Redwood Church of God, and we thank you for honoring us with the love of God that is abundant supply here amongst the people of God. And Lord, this is where we come together to hear your word. I ask you, Lord, and I pray that you feed your people and that, Holy Spirit, you would speak through me as we share your word today. In Jesus' name I pray, and we can all say, Brother, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Amen. He joined the church last week. We'll have a certificate for you next week, okay? Amen. Amen. Is there any other new faces here? Anybody that's here for the very first time? I think everybody's uh, pretty much acquainted, so... Oh, and you know what? I really love you guys so much. And I just love what God's doing in this church. And I uh, just am so grateful for everything that the Lord has done. Amen. So this is going to be the final conclusion of... Uh, we've been covering the tribulation period. And we're going to um, cover a few more events of the tribulation period today. And uh, hopefully, Lord willing, this will be... Uh, drawing it to a conclusion. So, today we're going to talk about Babylon the Great. Mystery Babylon. Have you heard of that? Do you know what it is? We're going to find out. Amen? So, Babylon the Great. Brother Miles, are you uh, prepared to, to help me out here? Can we get the weather report first, please? The weather center forecast for the Page Lake, Powell, Canab, and Fredoni areas. We're going to say it's hot and very hot. <laughs> Give him a hand. You know, I, I love Deacon Miles. Uh, I call him Brother Miles because him and I go way back. But Deacon Miles is a faithful servant of God. Amen. And uh, thank you for stepping up and helping us um, with the word and speaking it with such clarity and emphasis. Amen? Okay. So before we start, um, how many people are familiar with the book of Revelation? Yeah, well, that's good. That's good because a lot of people will shy away from it. And uh, there's a lot of prophetic in uh, the book of Revelation. And so a lot of it doesn't really have um, clarity as far as how things are going to play out. So what we're going to do is just cover some scripture and glean from it what we can today, okay? Go ahead, brother. Babylon the Great, Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come. Do you remember the seven bowls? Yes. Okay. We covered it last week. Go ahead. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, Having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Wow. Babylon the Great, Revelation 17, 5. And on her forehead was the name was written, a name that was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints really? and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Uh -huh. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Revelation 18, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. He cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen, 
and become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I've heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, unless you receive of her plagues. 18.5 For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her inequities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. Wow. In the measure that she has glorified herself and lived in luxury, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine, she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her. When they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Revelation 19, 1. After these things, I heard something like a great and mighty shout of a vast multitude in heaven exclaiming, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory, splendor, majesty, and power, dominion, and might belong to our God. Because his judgments are true and righteous. Read that again. Because why? Because his judgments are true and righteous. Yeah. He let, has, us not, let us not lose sight of that. This is judgment. Go ahead. Because his judgments are true and righteous. He has judged, convicted, and pronounced sentence on the great prostitute, idolatrous, who was corrupting and ruining and poisoning the earth with her adultery, idolatry, and he has imposed the penalty for the blood of his bondservants on her. Mm -hmm. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke shall ascend forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and the four living creatures also fell down and worship God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Then from the throne there came a voice, saying, Praise our God, all you bondservants of his, you who fear him, the small common and great distinguished part of the difficulty. With okay, the just stop there for a minute. So it's, it's clear to us that Babylon is a city. Amen? Amen. And um, oh, before I get ahead of myself, go ahead and finish reading this. Part of the difficulty with identifying Babylon the Great... So have you all been wondering, who is Babylon? Where is Babylon? Just to give you a little history, Babylon, the original Babylon, the ruins of it are in the country of Iraq... Um, just south of uh, Baghdad. So obviously it can't be that Babylon because it doesn't exist anymore. Amen? Amen? Go ahead. Part of the difficulty with identifying Babylon the Great in Revelation 17 and 18 is the presence of mystery in Revelation 17.5. Mystery or mysterion in the Greek, points to a truth not previously known, but soon to be revealed. Mm -hmm. This term is used by Paul in Ephesians 3.3 as he discusses the relationship between the Gentiles and the Jews within the church. In Revelation 17, Babylon the Great is considered a mystery, 
thus making it difficult to identify. The angel who speaks to John identifies Babylon the Great as the great city that rules over the kings of the earth, Revelation 17, 18. The angel also provides some detail of the events leading up to the fall of Babylon the Great, Revelation 17, 1 through 5. At the conclusion of this vision, John stands in great wonder, perplexed as to what the vision means. Graciously, the angel provides an interpretation of the vision and the events it relates. Revelation 17, 7 through 18. Amen. Okay. Let's go ahead and um, review some things that we do know about Babylon. Go ahead. The vision describes a woman, or harlot, sitting upon a scarlet beast covered in blasphemous names. The woman is immoral and corrupt, leading others down the same path of corruption. This woman is dressed in expensive, fine apparel, and the beast she rides has seven heads and ten horns. On the woman's forehead is her identity, Babylon the Great the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth, Revelation 17, 5. From John's vision, we draw several conclusions about Babylon the Great. Babylon, in the end of times, will have influence over all peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages, Revelation 17, 15. So you can always go back to these scriptures and look up and see if this is so. I would encourage you to do that. It will really help a lot. We just don't have time to cover all of the scriptures here today, so I'm just referencing them. Go ahead. Babylon the Great will promote religious heresy, indicated by its association with blasphemy, Revelation 17.3, and its depiction as a prostitute, See Psalms 106.39, Leviticus 17.7, yeah. 7, and Judges 2.17. So we do know that Babylon will have influence over all peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. It will be a center. Babylon the Great will permit, promote religious heresy. Okay, what next? Babylon will kill the true followers of God. The woman is drunk with the blood of of God's holy people, the blood of those who were born testimony of, to Jesus, Revelation. Pure 17, evil. Go ahead. 17.6, 18.24. Babylon, in the end of times, will once again be uh -huh. a place of luxury and wealth. Uh -huh. Revelation 18.7 and 11 through 17. Babylon the Great will be a center of worldwide merchandising. Revelation 18, 19, and 23. Mm -hmm. Babylon will actively lead people astray into corruption. Revelation 18, 23, and 19, 2. Babylon the Great will be associated with a federation of ten kings plus the beast. Revelation 17, yep. 12, and 13, 4. End times Babylon will thrive for a time. But then the beast and the ten kings conclude that such a financial, religious, and political system is no longer needed. Imagine that. They will proceed to dispose of it. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Revelation 17:16. The fall of Babylon the Great will result in God's judgment as he works through the ten kings to accomplish his will, Revelation 17, 17. To the end, the kingdoms that Babylon the Great relied on will turn against it, and by their hand, Babylon is destroyed. The beast and the kings ruling with him will wage war against Jesus Christ. They will lose of course, as Jesus is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, Revelation 17, 14. 
in Revelation 18, 2, an angel descends to the earth proclaiming the great news of Jesus' victory over Babylon the Great. All of heaven rejoices, Revelation 19, 1 through 3. In the end of times, the world's rebellion against God will rise to a fervor pitch, a fever pitch, and the Antichrist system will be characterized by rampant materialism, love of money, outrageous idolatry, religious sacrilege, and violence against Christians. And I just want to just stop there for a moment. Can we not see foreshadows of this oh, already? Yeah. It makes you like, is this for now? No, now is nothing. This is the most um, horrendous, evil time that mankind, will, this earth will ever see or ever see again. This is... And the reason why, one of the reasons why, because I, I asked the Lord, what is this, what is this to the body? Because we're going to be raptured. We're not going to see this. That's what I believe. Two reasons. Number one, it's urgent that we share the gospel. That we make disciples. Because as we make disciples, guess what? They make disciples. And, and the unity and the oneness come together. I, I don't know how to express to the body what the Holy Spirit has put in me to relate to you about the end times, other than to say it's very near. And I know throughout the church age, that's been preached over and over and over. It's not new to me, but for for me, I'm doing what the Lord has ask me to do to say wake up this word is coming to you today and the past weeks for a reason he's stirring us Redwood Church of God is an end times church I'll repeat that the Redwood Church of God is an end times church. Amen. He's poured his love out into this body. We are experiencing things. I've heard people tell me, Pastor James, I've never, ever experienced the things that I experience here, the love that is present among us. That's not to gloat or to build ourselves up. It's all God preparing us to do the work that he's called us to do. This is horrible. Once the restrainer is lifted at the rapture, the lawlessness one will be let loose. No more Holy Spirit. He'll be free to reign and to cause terror and murder and suffering and judgment's coming. Judgment's coming on the whole earth. Yes, there will be people that are, that are going to be saved throughout the tribulation period. That's going to happen. But the ones that don't are going to suffer horribly. I got more to share later. Go ahead, brother, wherever you left off. I'm just going to begin at the end of the paragraph. In the end times, yeah. the world's rebellion against God will rise to a fever pitch. Rebellion. The Antichrist system will be characterized by rampant materialism, love of money, outrageous idolatry, religious sacrilege, and violence against Christians. But this time will be short. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus wins. Yes. Babylon the Great is destroyed, and the Antichrist is thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, Revelation 19.20. Jesus alone is the almighty Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Can I get an amen? Amen. So, so that leads us into 
the Armageddon and the return of the king. Amen? That's what we're going to discuss next. Before we move on, a lot of people speculate about Babylon. And I just want to make this clear. It says it's a mystery. And because it's a mystery, we don't know who. Some, some will say, I think it's the United States, maybe New York City. Maybe it is us. I don't know. We certainly fit some of the descriptions of this great city. We are the center, the financial center of the whole world. We have the largest economy. Is that going to change? Yeah, it could. But it doesn't really um, cause us any good to know that answer because it's just covering up the real issue. Do we need to get busy? The Lord says, get busy. Look at your co-workers. Look at the clerk that you see on the other side of the counter every day. Can you say, good morning, God bless you, Jesus loves you. And, and just plant a seed. There's so many things we can do. And, and I gotta, I'm going to commend those who are going out on the street that are taking their time to go out and minister and to pray. God bless you. We need more of that. But that's not all of it. That's outreach. Church, we have a ministry called inReach. As the outreach brings them in, the inReach accepts them and loves them and, and disciples them. We're doing this together. Amen. You got to have both. Yep. Invite people to church. Tell them, get them here because the food's good. Come on. <laughs> Or it's nice and cool in the hot weather. Yep. All right? And uh, and we got a benevolent fund. Whatever. Amen. Just get them through the door. Amen? Amen. And then once we have them here, we can love on them. Yep. God's two greatest commandments. That's what, that's what we live. And love, the love of God will drop every single wall that might be put up. Nothing can stop the love of God. Amen. Some are looking. Some, of the, some will be sh the ones shaking their fists in rebellion as the rocks and the hail and the locusts and all of the plagues come upon them. They still won't repent. That's what the Bible says. They refuse to repent. And judgment's coming. But there's those that will. Okay, Armageddon and the return of the king. Does everybody know what Armageddon is? Yeah. All right, okay. We're going to find out. I start, Revelation chapter 19 is one of my most favorite chapters in the whole Bible. I remember shortly after becoming a Christian, I used to just read that chapter over and over and over again. It brought me so much joy and so much hope. And I was just rejoicing because, well, I'll, I'll explain that part to you in a minute, what I get jacked up about. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, go ahead. Revelation 19, 6. Then I heard something like the shout of a vast multitude, like the boom of many pounds. Have you waves. ever been to the beach? The ocean, and they got a rock wall, and all of a sudden those waves come in and boom, and they hit those rocks. They said it's a it's a distinctive noise. Amen. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Like the boom of many pounding waves, like the roar of mighty peals of thunder, uh -huh. saying, "Hallelujah," for the Lord our God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Ruler of all reigns yes let us rejoice and shout for joy hallelujah let come us... on hallelujah hallelujah yeah our king reigns amen. amen do you know he's your king yeah. he's your lord yeah. he's your savior yes but he's also the bridegroom amen. and guess what we're his bride 
We're his bride. You talk about an intimate, passionate love relationship, nothing gets greater than a bridegroom and a bride. Come on. And when we come to Jesus, when we come to him, we can come to him as his bride. Amen. For those of you who've been married that are males, when you fall in love and you enter into a marriage, you take care of that bride. Amen. You protect her. You watch over her. You look out for her. You do things for her. You make her life a better life. You lead. And she follows. And it's nice if she obeys, but sometimes they don't. <laughs> and sometimes we don't. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go ahead, brother. Verse 7, let us shout, rejoice and shout for joy. Let us give him glory and honor, for the marriage of the Lamb has come at last, and his bride, the redeemed, has prepared herself. Pay attention. She, she has been permitted to dress in fine linen, dazzling white and clean. Dazzling white and clean. For the Wow, bride. think about that. Dazzling white and clean. We've been permitted, the word says, to dress in this fine linen. Dazzling, dazzling. Let that conjure up a vision in your mind. Dazzling. Have you ever used that word? Mm. Oh, honey, you look dazzling tonight. <laughs> Amen? It's a wonderful, beautiful word. It stops you dead in your tracks. Dazzling. White. That's and whiter than a white that we could ever imagine. And it conjures up in my mind as a brightness. Dazzling. That's how we're clothed. The marriage supper of the Lamb. That's after we leave this earth. The Bible talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where we're all going to be together. The whole the whole clan. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wonderful time of celebration. And we're dressed for the event. Go ahead. Verse 8. She has been permitted to dress in fine linen, dazzling, white, and clean. For the fine linen signifies the righteous acts of the saints. Stop. Stop. character set apart it matters every time you've not permitted the old man to speak through you but in your character you have acted out of the new man with the power of the spirit in conducting yourself to be conformed to the image of Christ that's what this life is about, one of the things. But it's major, is that we allow the Holy Spirit to transform who we are in our character. Amen. So that when, when, when the Father sees us, he sees his Son and his character. You can't say you're a follower of Jesus Christ and not have the character of Christ. But what are we going to let rule? What are we going to press in to develop, to understand, to learn, to endeavor, to be conformed? That means to be shaped. Are you allowing God to shape you? Or are you resisting? I don't want to do that, Lord. I don't want to do that. That's too hard. I don't know how to do that. You don't know, need to know how. You just need to say, okay. Have your way. Not my will, but your will, Lord in me. And you know what? If it, if it aggravates me, or if it causes me uh, emotional discomfort, so what? I'm going to suffer through whatever I need to suffer because I want to look like you. I want what you got. I want that in me. Amen. I want to look in your eyes on that blessed day 
and you hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. Enter in. Amen? Yeah. Let's give him a hand. Yeah. Because here you go. What is he exactly talking about here in the word? Go ahead. Continue on. For the fine linen signifies... For the fine linen signifies the righteous acts of the saints. The ethical conduct... Eth ethical conduct. Personal integrity. Personal integrity. Moral courage. Moral courage. Do you have the morals of an alley cat? Or do you have the morals to stand up and do and, ha and identify with the morals of God, of holiness, of righteousness? Because that goes against the flesh. And it takes courage. And the last one? The godly character there it is. of believers. Godly character. You were in dazzling white? Okay. Amen. I haven't even gotten into where I wanted to get to, but go ahead, brother. Revelation 19.11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he was riding on it, is called faithful and true, trustworthy, loyal, incorruptible, steady. That's and, Jesus. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war on the rebellious nations. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many royal crowns. And he has the name inscribed on him, which no one knows or understands except himself. Think he about is, that. Think about that. What in the world is that? A name that is inscribed on him, which, one, which no one knows or understands. Except himself. Doesn't that uh, spark something in you? Mm -hmm. What is it? I want to know, don't you? Yep. I want to know. Maybe he'll tell his bride. We go... Jesus, what does it mean? Because I really want to know. I think someday we will. Amen. Go ahead. 13. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. What's John 1 1? Beginning was the Word, and the Word was. The word was. Amen. And the armies of heaven dressed in fine linen. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's wearing this robe dipped in blood. His and name, his name is, is called, called the Word, the Word of, God. of God. And the and armies of heaven. Dressed in what, fine linen. What, what, just, hold on a second. What are the armies of heaven? The angels? I'm thinking the we're gonna We're going to find out. It includes the, the angels, I believe. But more specifically, this is why I started out on whoops, the bride in white. See where it says she has been permitted to dress in fine linen, dazzling white and clean, for the fine linen signates the righteous acts of who? The saints. The saints. The saints are dressed in dazzling white, the fine linen. Don't lose track of that as we go on. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead, brother. And the armies of heaven, dressed in fine linen, dazzling, white and clean, yes. followed him on white horses. That's us. From That's his us. Go ahead. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, his word, with which he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury, wrath of God, of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, in his judgment of the rebellious world, 
and on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name inscribed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I, I, I thought Jesus was a lamb. It's just nice and gentle. Is, is Jesus capable of pouring out wrath? I'll just ask the guys that had the whip taken to him in the temple. That's, that's minor. I'd say whip me any day, Jesus. I don't want any of this. Uh-oh. This is that the right one? Yeah, Lord of Lords. Okay, go ahead. The Antichrist, the beast, will unite the world during the tribulation. So the Antichrist is going to be very busy during this time. He's uniting the entire world of the, of the non-believers. Go ahead. All those who uh -huh. have taken his mark and worshipped him will join his armies to battle against the Lord. Evil will make its final stand against the Lord and all that is good. Here we come. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not provide its light and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And at that time, the sign of the Son of Man coming in his glory will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth, especially Israel, will mourn, regretted the rebellion and rejection of the Messiah, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory in brilliance and splendor. Mm -hmm. Revelation 117. 17. 17. Thank you. Behold, he is coming with clouds. Lord Jesus, help. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Whose eye? Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes, nations all the of what? the earth, all the tribes, nations uh. of the earth will mourn over him, realizing their sin and guilt and anticipating the coming wrath. It is to be. Amen. So it is to be. Amen. Come again. Revelation nineteen seventeen. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with, a cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of thy great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. 19, and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. And those who worshipped his image. I just want to stop there for a minute. Who is the beast? He's the Antichrist. Amen? Amen. And, and, and he specifies also the false prophet. So both of these guys are um, being talked about here. Go ahead. The mark of the beast and those who worship his image. Uh -huh. These two were cast alive into the lake of burning fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Jesus wins, the devil Amen. loses.
Right. The Antichrist will fight with all the strength of Satan and his evil ones, but they will be no there will be no completion. Competition. Competition for Jesus the King. The Antichrist and his false prophet will be captured and cast into the lake of fire. With the sword from his mouth, Jesus will kill everyone that remains. It will be the largest, bloodiest battle in history. The victor and his armies will remain unscathed, but the birds will feast on the bloody flesh of the nations. After the battle, Satan will be bound for a thousand years, Revelation 22, while Jesus reigns on the earth. After that, Satan must be released for a little while to deceive the nations once again and then finally cast into the lake of fire for eternity, Revelation 20, 7 through 10. God so, could... so what's the purpose of this? What's the purpose? Have you asked yourself that question? I did. Read, brother. God could destroy evil in many ways. He could. He chooses. So what's the purpose of having a bloody battle? Yeah. First, Armageddon concludes Jesus' judgment upon Israel. The tribulation period represents a time of divine indignation against the people of Israel. The people who rejected their Messiah, the people who repeatedly failed to heed the corrective and punitive judgment of God. It is no accident that this future period is often referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 37. Amen. This is the time of Pastor James' trouble because I'm running out of time. <laughs> Go ahead. Keep reading. Second, Armageddon marks the final judgment upon the countries that have persecuted Israel yep. with all the hostile nations of the world gathered together in the battle of Armageddon in the valley of Jehoshaphat. God will deal with them finally and decisively. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Finally, Armageddon constitutes a formal judgment on all the nations that have rejected him. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Mm -hmm. God's activity and warnings are often missed by people pursuing ungodly goals. So, so right there, God's activity let's receive and that. Because when we're, when we're communicating with others about the gospel, we need to have some understanding and some wisdom. And so they often miss these warnings and the activity and the things that are going on. So don't be amazed that they don't relate or don't understand. It's the power of the Word of God that will open up their minds and their hearts to the Word and reveal that to them. But don't let it be a discouraging thing to you. Go ahead. God's activity and warnings are often missed by the people pursuing ungodly goals. Mm -hmm. Because God is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, the nations do not believe he will judge them one day. 2 Peter 3, 9. But be assured, he is storing up wrath against a day to come when each person's deeds will be judged accordingly. Romans 2, 5 through 6. The Bible is clear. One of these days, God will have enough and his judgment will pour down like a consuming fire against wickedness in the earth's final battle. One day, I don't want to put words in God's mouth, but what I perceive out of that is 
I've had enough. This is going to stop. You're not going to persecute my people anymore. Judgment will come, and judgment has come. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay. Second so, Peter. You know, I, I, we're going to actually go through a whole chapter. And so there's going to be a lot of reading. And I asked Lord, I said, God, that's so much scripture. But he said, read it. This is what he's saying to us, to this church, and to the whole world today. And I encourage you, in your quiet time, in the Word, go to Second Peter chapter 3 and receive this Word and let it speak to you. We are the end times church. Go ahead. Second Peter 3, 1. Beloved, I am now writing you this second letter. In this, as in the first one, I am stirring up your untainted mind to remind you that you should remember the words spoken in the past about the future by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior given by your apostles, his personally chosen representatives. First of all, know without any doubt that mockers will come in the last days with their mocking, following after their own human desires and saying, where is the promise of his coming? What has become of it? For ever since the fathers fell asleep in death, all things have continued exactly as they did from the beginning of creation. For they willingly forget the fact that the heavens existed long ago by the word of God, and the earth was formed out of the water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly people. Here it is in Second Peter chapter 3, the very things that we were reading about. Judgment's coming. Nevertheless, do not let this one fact escape your notice. Beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act, and is not slow about his promise, as, as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient toward you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Remember that, church. It's not God's will that any man should perish. Let that be something that gives you confidence in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Know that it's not his will. His will is that they come to repentance. How many people have ever been broken before? You know what? It feels good. Didn't feel good at the time. A lot of tears rolled down my cheeks. But afterwards, I was so grateful because I realized God had to break me for one reason, so he could put me back together. And when God puts you back together, he does it right. Because left to, left to our own devices, our own ways, we don't know what we're doing. Be bold when it comes to the things of God. Don't be shy. Do not be ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. There's no shame in that name. If you're going to make yourself a fool, don't worry about being a fool for man. Worry about being a fool for Christ. 
Amen. I can do that. Go ahead, brother. The Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act and is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will vanish with a mighty and roar, thunderous Here roar. We go again. The heavens will vanish with a mighty and thunderous roar, and the material elements will be destroyed with intense heat. Intense the heat. The earth and the works on, that are on it will be burned up. Judgment's coming. The Word of God is infallible. Amen? Amen. You can rely on the Word. Amen. Go to the Word. Go ahead, brother. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? In the meantime, in holy behavior that is in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer. As at, children of God, as born-again believers, we are set apart. Amen. We do not relate to the things of the world. We relate to the things of God. We are his bride. We are betrothed to the king of kings. We are no longer our own. We're his property. Amen. We submit to him. We're set apart, holy and pure, not contaminate ourselves with the things and the lust and the perversion and all the things that are, that are going on in the world. Be set apart from that. Don't let that thing inside you get reconnected. Set apart. Wait for your husband, the bridegroom. He's coming. Because he said he was. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be in the meantime? In holy behavior that is in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer. And in godliness, displaying profound reverence toward your awesome God. While you earnestly look for and wait for the coming of the day of God, for on this day the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the material elements will melt with intense heat. But in accordance with his promise, we expectantly await new heavens and a new earth, which are in which the righteousness the wind in which the righteous dwells. You're doing good, brother. Hallelujah. We're almost here. Second Peter 3.14. So, beloved, since you are looking forward to these things, be diligent and make every effort to be found by him at his return, spotless and blameless. The word speaking to you, church. In peace, that is, inwardly calm, with a sense of spiritual well-being and confidence, having lived a life of obedience to him, and consider the patience of our Lord, his delay in judging and avenging wrongs as salvation, that is, allowing time for more to be saved. Mm -hmm. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him by God, speaking about these things as he does in all of his letters, in which there are some things that are difficult to understand, which untaught and unstable who have fallen into error twist and misinterpret, just as they do the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, let me warn you, beloved, knowing these things beforehand, be on your guard, so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men who distort doctrine and fall from your own steadfastness of mind, knowledge, truth, and faith, but grow spiritually mature in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, honor, majesty, splendor, both now and 
and to the day of eternity. Amen. What does it mean to be on guard? Ask yourself that. Because this is what the Lord has given me to give to the church today. The internet. The internet is a false teacher. It will lead you astray. This is the truth. This is the word of God. Don't be lazy. Or don't be looking for entertainment. Be like the Bereans. Search the scriptures to see if these things are not so. Because you can get enticed and drug away by every false teaching, prophetic word. I mean, you go to YouTube and there's all kinds of from A to Z. Hello. Don't listen to that. Unless you know it's a trusted teacher. I'm not saying that everything's bad on the internet. Don't get me wrong. Because Redwood Church of God's on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is, be on guard. When your spirit gives you a check, go to the Word. And reject anything that's not according to the Word. Amen. This will preserve your life. This will keep you on track. You won't be all over the place listening to this and believing that, and, and then what happens? Confusion and uncertainty. And when the day comes, it catches you off guard because you're confused, because you haven't been in the truth. There we are, church, following our great and glorious king who's on a white horse, and we will return with him in dazzling white linen garments. Stay true to the Lord. Stay sanctified and set apart. Remain holy and blameless. Walk upright. Spend time in relationship with the God Almighty. Enter into his presence as his bride. Church, you're his bride. Amen. That has special meaning. Very special. He loves us. I mean, human, humans can't even comprehend. That's the closest that we can get is when we look at our brides and the love that we might have for them. But that's just a morsel of the love that he has for us. We're not our own. We belong to him. We accepted him as our Lord and Savior. We've entered into a marriage covenant with the Lord. Let's hold true to our covenant because you know why? He's true to his covenant with us. Amen. He is faithful and true. And when you're in that place, in right standing relationship with God, walking the way as his holy bride, things open up. You hear the word, and it feeds your soul. You'll be saying, I got the joy, 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 down in my heart, Where? down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 down, down in, in my heart to stay. Amen. And I'm so happy. <laughs> so very happy. Yeah, I I'm telling you. Just, it's, it's not hard. It's, it requires a made-up mind. Where you stand in a place, I don't care what you say, devil. I don't care what you say, flesh. The answer is no. I'm clinging to Jesus. <laughs> so anyway, Father, I just uh, thank you for this opportunity to share your word today. And I'm going to put out an altar call. What is an altar call? An opportunity for anyone who does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and bridegroom want to enter there and become born again. Just come forward and I'll pray with you. And you'll receive Jesus Christ and become born again. Anyone that does not know Jesus. Okay. Remember, 
by your own confession, by not coming forward, you've just agreed to be set apart and to be blameless and holy before him. You're his bride. Second altar call. Anyone that has strayed away for whatever reason from that intimate, passionate love relationship with the Lord, there's something that's preventing you from getting back into that place with the Lord. We can take care of that today. If that's you, just come forward and we'll pray with you and get you back on track. Anyone that wants to rededicate their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, please come forward. Anyone. This is your family. There's no guilt. There's no shame here. We're doing this together as a family, as a body, as a group of believers. Okay. We're all saved and we're all in perfect relationship with the Lord. That's exactly the way I like it. Amen? Okay, so, so I, I will remain after I close in prayer. If anybody wants individual prayer, you may come forward. Um, I'll, I'll be over here. Um, <clears throat> deacons um, will be setting up the tables for our uh, meal. And so I ask the people here in the front row if you could just push your, ta your chairs back and kind of give the guys room so they can get the table set up as quickly as possible. So after you get your food... You have a place to sit. And here at Redwood Church of God, our custom is, is that our visitors go first, uh, women go first, and the immobile go first. The rest of us able-bodied people will wait and then go get our food, okay? Does that sound good? All right. Father, we just thank you now for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Oh, thank you for your presence here today. We love you so much. We cry out, Abba, Father, we love you. And we pray, Lord, that you'll find our fellowship pleasing in your sight, that you'll find our conversation pleasing to your ear. And as we go forth throughout the rest of this day, we just pray, Lord, that we will walk in a manner that is directed by you. Bless this food that will go to the nourishment of our bodies to give us strength and energy to do your will and um, not to our waistlines. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.